Wednesday afternoon here in Tampa, Florida. It's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for today, Dr. Bronco Van Oppen, and this is his third lecture in the series. We have a fourth one coming up on December 6th at 1 p.m. that looks at um, identity in antiquity, which should be fascinating as well. Um, today's talk is um, focused um, on Minoan Knossos. Again, hope I'm getting that correct. Um, but Franco will give the full title and full introduction when I turn it over to him. Um, for those of you who are just joining us, and if this is your first time tuning into our lecture series, just to give you a little bit of a brief bio on Bronco. Um, Bronco is based in the Netherlands, so he joins us from across the Atlantic. And for the past five years, he has been at the Allard Pearson Museum. He received his um, PhD at the City University of New York, and he is a specialist in the queenship during the period from Alexander the Great to Cleopatra. So with that, I am going to turn it directly over Bronco so we can get um, our lecture started. And again, we look forward to hearing from you and hearing your questions um, in the chat. Hi Bronco, how are you today? Hi Joanna, I'm very well and thank you for uh, the introduction. Uh, thank you all for joining us today via Zoom or uh, via Facebook. Uh, in this webinar today, I will present a proposal for an exhibition uh, about Minoan Knossos uh, and the Greek age, that is the Greek age civilization uh, of ancient Greece. But before I begin, I would like to thank the team at the TMA for all their support and assistance, providing background information and images while I am working here from home across the Atlantic six times uh, time zones away. I also want to extend my warmest gratitude to Dr. Bob Bianchi for his friendship, his enthusiasm and his support, not only for this proposal, but the two previous Antiquity Circle lectures as well. So ancient, uh, the ancient city of Knossos is located near Tampa's sister city, Heraklion, on the island of Crete. It is world famous for ex extensive archaeological ruins, and the site is forever associated with myths about the labyrinth, about King Minos and his queen Pasiphae, about the Minotaur slain by Theseus, and about Daedalus and his son Icarus, who spread their wings to escape the maze in which they were imprisoned. In today's presentation, I would like to pitch an international exhibition concept about the city of Minos. The talk has three main sections, beginning first with an overview of Mino and Knossos, followed by a brief summary of the main myths and legends the ancient Greeks remembered about Knossos, and lastly, some further particulars of the actual exhibition concept. As Brittany pointed out, if during this talk you have a question, Please feel free to use the raise hand function if you're on Zoom. Uh, you may write your questions in the comments or leave one on Facebook uh, or speak um, when your volume is unmuted, if that is what you prefer. There will certainly be room for questions at the end of the presentation. We are always interested in what you think. Uh, and this webinar is again, explicitly designed to invite your input. There will be a survey at the end that we also welcome uh, if you fill out. So with all that said, uh, let us begin. The island of Crete has been inhabited by humans since the Stone Age, at least since 100, uh, 130,000 years ago. Uh, it became the center of the first European civilization from the third through the second millennium before the common era. Located near Heraklion, the sister city of Tampa, Knossos was the island's largest Bronze Age settlement with a population of about 100,000 at the height of its power uh, around 1600 BCE. The Palace of Knossos was the chief political and administrative as well as religious center on Crete during this Aegean Bronze Age. The extensive archaeological ruins of Knossos have become world famous and, under normal conditions, attract hundreds if not thousands of visitors every day. 
The site was first excavated in modern times by pioneering English archaeologist Arthur Evans from 1900 through 1905. It is also Evans who popularized the term Minoan civilization for the Cretan palatial culture he unearthed in Knossos because the maze-like structures of the city with its more than 1,000 interlocking chambers reminded him of the labyrinth of the Minotaur known from classical Greek myths and le legends. Other famous Bronze Age sites, uh, namely Troy in Northwestern Asia Minor and Mycenae on the Peloponnese, had been discovered by the German amateur archeologist Heinrich Schliemann in the 1870s. The wealth of Knossos was based on extensive trade in olive oil and wine, saffron and wool, timber and tin, often shipped in pottery vessels that have been attested across the Mediterranean. Tin, to be sure, is an essential component together with copper for making the alloy bronze, the material after which the era of the Bronze Age is named. The Cretans could maintain their trade due to their powerful fleet, which they also used against piracy. A network of trade routes connected Knossos uh, to other Bronze Age sites, not only on Crete, um, but also, uh, for instance, Memphis, the capital of Egypt, Byblos and Tyre in the Levant, that is present day Lebanon, Troy in Anatolia, also known as Asia Minor, that is present day Turkey. Uh, other islands such as Cyprus and Rhodes, uh, as well as Thera and Naxos in the Aegean Sea. Mycenae on the Peloponnese, that is the Greek mainland. Um, and what came to be known as Athens, uh, whose hinterland was very rich in silver. Some trade routes even led to the West, including South Italy, Sicily, Sardinia, and even uh, southern Spain. Objects such as this alabaster vase with the hieroglyphic royal name of Pharaoh Thutmose III evince these wide ranging commercial and diplomatic ties. This vase was found in a Bronze Age tomb near the secondary port of Knossos in present day Herakion. Tutmosis was, by the way, the nephew and for over 20 years the co-regent of the great female pharaoh Hatshepsut. We are talking about the 15th century before the Common Era and for further chronological indications, Tutmosis was the sixth ruler of the 18th dynasty of ancient Egypt uh, and four generations later, the 10th pharaoh of that dynasty was the famous Akhenaten, whose son was of course, the famous Tutankhamun. So like the Tampa Bay area, Knossos owned its power to its maritime prowess. What is noteworthy is that according to ancient Greek historians such as Herodotus and Thucydides, King Minos established the maritime power of Knossos and rid the Aegean Sea of piracy. Classical Greek authors of the 5th century thus not only believed that King Minos was an actual historical figure, they also reflect some dim recollection of the power of Minoan Knossos, uh, and we're talking about something like a millennium later. In ancient Greek and Latin literature, the island of Crete was actually known for harboring pirates, and in classical Greek the word Cretan was a byword for untrustworthiness. Uh, and the Cretan philosopher Epimenides of Knossos, who lived around 600 before the Common Era, made the immortal but paradoxical statement that all Cretans are liars. But can Epimen Epimen excuse me, Epimenides, who is himself a Cretan, have spoken the truth then? Now the wealth of the Bronze Age civilization on Crete is very well evinced by colorful frescoes and other beautiful crafted masterpieces illustrating aspects of human, animal and plant life. Um, I can obviously not show you everything, so allow me to just quickly give you an impression of these wonderful works of art.
Here you see a scene of a profession, uh, procession. Uh, it is not clear though if this represents a religious ritual or some kind of tribute bearing ceremony. And notice in particular the, tip, the different shapes of the vases that the men carry. On this wall, uh, from the throne room of the palace of Knossos, sorry, Victoria, you can shift, shift back to the next slide again. I'm confusing you. Um, the throne room uh, at the palace of Knossos was decorated by an image of this powerful mythological creature. It is often called a griffin, um, but its appearance is quite different from what we know from classical Greek imagery. The island of Thera, uh, which is now called Santorini, lies directly to the north of Crete and also features Minoan frescoes. Uh, here you see one with bluish gray monkeys. And on the next slide, you see papyrus, which is not indigenous to the islands in the Aegean Sea. So this mural must uh, be inspired by Egyptian paintings. And of course, not only frescoes have survived from Minoan civilization. And again, I can only show you a very small and also random collection of objects today. Uh, here are some masterful uh, vessels in ceramic to the left, rock crystal in the middle and alabaster uh, on the right. They all date from what is called the late palatial period. Um, and if I could add one object to my wish list, it would be this splendid marine style vase decorated with an Im image of an octopus. So Minoan artwork represents athletic ritual and religious scenes. Um, what is surprising is how few references there are to warfare. This had, has left Excuse me, this has led earlier scholars such as Arthur Evans to speculate that the Minoans were peaceful people uh, with no army to speak of, who traded far and wide, wide without any expansionist campaigns of conquest. Um, whether that is really the case uh, <clears throat> is difficult to argue. Uh, there certainly must have been an army and a powerful fleet, and the kind of weapons that you see here. Uh, must uh, evince the presence of that army as well. Um, also found very often are these kinds of double-bladed axes that they have been discovered in many Bronze Age sites on Crete and have often been found in sacred graves, uh, excuse me, sacred caves, so they must have had some kind of religious uh, meaning perhaps. And what is interesting is that they are called labris, in the ancient language of Lydia. Lydia is in Western Asian minor, modern Turkey. And this has suggested to some scholars that the word labyrinth uh, actually comes from this word labris, um, and therefore that labyrinth means something like uh, the place of the double-bladed axis, um, and that the uh, maze at Knossos uh, was named after these blades. The most fascinating scenes in Minoan art relate to some kind of acrobatic performance um, of uh, a, a figure leaping over a bull, as you see here in this modern reconstruction of a fresco from the palace at Knossos. I say modern reconstruction so because if you look very closely, you can see that only fragments have remained and the rest have been filled in. Um, but the gold signet that you see there in front, in the center, uh, depicts the same kind of bull leaping scene. Um, whether these uh, represent a form of entertainment or a ritual in connection with bull worship is widely debated among scholars. Uh, bull leaping existed elsewhere as well in the second millennium before the common era, for instance, in Syria, in Egypt, uh, in uh, the land of the Hittites, Anatolia, and even in the Indus Valley. And today, of course, it survives still in modern France and certainly also in Spain, as well as in Tamil regions of India. Um, 
so some of the most celebrated works of Milo in art represent bulls. And this prominence may be due to the power of the taurine imagery. It may reflect the importance of cattle for the wealth of Knossos, um, but it may also be associated with Cretan myths and religious worship. Um, by the way, if there are any questions, do let me know or uh, write your comment and uh, Brittany can let me know. Um, but if there aren't, then we can move on. Feel free anyway to uh, let us know if something is unclear. Perhaps the most intriguing and mysterious figure from Mino and Knossos are these statuettes of women with bared breasts, either clutching snakes in their hands or, or with snakes coiling around uh, the arms. Both of these images that you see here were discovered in the so-called sanctuary treasury at the palace of Knossos and they date to around 1600 BCE. They are both dressed in rich garments with an open bodice, a high belt around narrow waists, and uh, they wear a long flounced dress with an adorned skirt uh, over it. One of them wears a crown with a cat or other feline creature on her head. The other wears a tall headdress with a snake twisted around it. And uh, she also has a snake tied around her hips. Even the embroidery of her skirt resembles snakes. It remains unknown, again, unfortunately, what these figures actually represent. Interpretations range from a snake goddess, a mistress of animals, a fertility icon, a priestess engaged in some kind of fertil fertility ritual involving snakes, um, or perhaps uh, should we understand the bare breasts and the serpents as sexual symbols? So much remains unknown about uh, Mino and Knossos because the two types of writing that have survived from the Bronze Age world of Crete um, have so far eluded decipherment. Um, one of them is called the Glyptic script uh, that is found on the Phaestus disc, uh, as you see here, and the other is called uh, Linear A that is found on numerous clay tablets. Um, yeah, there's a question here about the um, bull heads and how they function as pouring vessels called Rita. Uh, and that's a great question, and I do not have the exact answer for that. I don't know exactly how they were used to pour uh, liquids with either. So uh, thank you, thank you for that question, and sorry that again I have no clear answer for you. Um, so I was talking about scripts that have not been deciphered yet. Uh, the glyptic script, such as you see in this image first appeared on Crete in the late third millennium before the common era, and it remained in use until about 1500 BCE. Uh, the Phaistos disc dates to the late in that period, around 1550 BCE. It features glyphs on both sides of the disc that were stamped into the unbaked clay in a spiral. Uh, these glyphs may be ideograms, that means that they represent the word that they depict. Uh, they do represent recognizable objects, but the text itself cannot be deciphered or even partially understood. It is completely unclear what this text is about. Um, it is also unknown what language lies behind that script. Uh, to be sure, that also means that the ethnicity of the population of Bronze Age Crete remains unknown. Uh, I personally doubt that they were related to speakers of Indo-European languages such as Greek. The Linear A script that I mentioned earlier was developed in the early second millennium before the Common Era, while the Cretan Glyphic script to be sure, was still in use. Uh, but Linear A also remains undeciphered. 
Um, Suzanne Williams asks if there are many surviving discs with these scripts, and no, there are not that many. There are much more linear A tablets that survive than uh, the uh, earlier form of writing. Um, Franco, we also have a we also have a question about the size of the clay disc. Um, I think. Oh, I think in, in centimeters, sorry. So uh, it's, I think about the size of my head. So it's pretty, pretty big, but I may, I may be, uh, not that I have a big head, uh, but it may be uh, that I'm confused. I don't have the size uh, off the top of my head. Um, Back to the linear A, since that was in existence at the same time as the other glyphic script, it is also not clear why there were two scripts in use at the same time. Do they reflect the same language or two different languages? Or do the two scripts perhaps reflect some kind of different function, maybe one being religious and the other being administrative? Uh, or maybe it reflects a different social status. Um, Linear A can be at least partially understood, even if it is not deciphered yet, uh, because some tablets record the same text both in the Cretan script as well as in what is known as Linear B, uh, which is a script from late Bronze Age Greece, mainland Greece, um, that is found in Knossos, but also on the Greek mainland at sites such as Mycenae, Pylos and Thebes. Um, so that form of writing emerged in the mid second millennium BCE and does reflect a proto-Greek language, meaning that it has been deciphered and it represents an early stage of the Greek language, uh, such as was spoken between the 16th and the 12th century before the common era. The writing fell in disuse in Greece at the end of the Bronze Age and Greek alphabetic writing uh, was adapted from Phoenician sometime around uh, 800 before the coming era. Um, another question, uh, if there is a relationship between uh, Egyptian hieroglyphs and the glyphic writing of um, Knossos uh, cannot be proven. Uh, there are theories that in Mesopotamia, the cuneiform was um, uh, developed also from uh, some kind of glyp uh, glyptic writing. So it may be that these cultures did influence each other, um, um, but uh, how exactly that is not uh, entirely sure. Um, Dr. Bianchi has informed us that the Feistos disc is 16 centimeters, so a little over six inches in diameter. Thank you, Dr. Bob. <clears throat> and um, regarding theories about the Feistos disc, what, the, what kind of language the script represents, the same as with Linear A, uh, all these uh, have so far proven uh, fruitless and to me, they are therefore, uh, um, yeah, quite meaningless. If you do not know what language lies behind it, it's impossible to uh, to get any farther. Um, so, how the power of Minoan Knossos and Bronze Age Crete uh, in general came uh, to fall, why it was destroyed. Um, is another question that there is no clear answer to. Um, there are indications of some very cataclysmic disturbances from the 17th century onwards, such as earthquakes, the eruption of the volcano of Thera, that is present-day Santorini, as well as invasions from Anatolia, from present-day Turkey, uh, and from the Greek mainland itself. These events led to widespread destruction that are easily visible in the archaeological record, um, but also large-scale resettlements and rebuilding efforts. Uh, political centers of Crete were occupied by Greeks from the mainland called the Mycenaean uh, 
uh, Greeks who gradually controlled most of the Aegean islands in the 13th, uh, 14th and 13th century, plural, sorry. Um, yet the Minoan civilization did manage to survive until about 1200 before the common era. So that's almost half a millennium. Uh, by that time, the entire Eastern Mediterranean suffered from what scholars call the late Bronze Age collapse, uh, an event that again is widely debated among scholars. Um, Brittany, are there any other questions I might address? Uh, yes. Do you have questions? Yes, go ahead. Um, are most of these objects currently in Heraklion, London, or elsewhere? Um, most of the objects that I have shown you, uh, the present location is either in the museum in Heraklion or they are still on site, uh, such as the Palace of Knossos uh, or uh, in Thera. Um, um, but most of the illustrations that I show you uh, are objects from the museum in Heraklion, called the Archaeological Museum of Heraklion. And we just got another one. <laughs> yeah. What is debated about the fall? The accuracy or whether it happened at all? No, the, the, that it happened is certain. The, it's the causes that have been debated. Is it warfare? Is it uh, earthquakes? Is it uh, uh, the volcanic eruption of Thera? Um, but because it's a period of half a millennium, uh, from about 17th century through the 13th, through the end of the 13th century, it cannot be one single event. Uh, and um, the entire Eastern Mediterranean suffered from uh, a collapse that uh, scholars cannot understand what the exact cause is. And therefore, it's probably not one single. Uh, if it's so difficult to find one single cause, it's probably uh, an accumulation of specific uh, or uh, related events. So um, if there are not any other questions, we can turn to the classical reception of Mino and Knossos, uh, because classical Greek myths concerning Knossos reveal a fascinating glimpse of the reception of the Bronze Age civilization. Uh, bear in mind that Minoan civilization reached its apex in the first half of the second millennium, while classical Greece flourished in the middle of the first millennium. The stories and depictions of the Minotaur and the labyrinth of Knossos reflect centuries of brilliantly transformed recollections, but bear little resemblance to the historical side. Uh, like I said, the word labyrinth is believed to have had a non or pre-Greek origin, referring to the double-bladed axis frequently found at Knossos. The mythic tale of the birth of the Minotaur, uh, the name literally means the bull of Minos. Uh, this half man, half bull creature may actually have been inspired by the many bull figures, bull-headed drinking vessels, and bull leaping scenes that uh, I've showed you uh, earlier. In classical mythology, King Minos of Knossos was the son of Zeus and Europa. He is already mentioned by Homer in the Ilias and the Odyssey, the oldest surviving ancient Greek works of literature. King Minos was married to Queen Pasiphae, uh, the daughter of Helios, and an ocean nymph called Perseus. Notice, incidentally, that therefore King Minos was son of Europa, the mother personification of the European continent, while his wife Pasiphae was the daughter of a woman called Perseus, that is, the mother personification of Persia. They lived according to mythology, right? Three generations before the Trojan War was supposed to happen, uh, which is to say that their grandson, Idominus, fought as one of the first ranking Greek generals at Troy. To secure his position on the throne against his brothers, Minos prayed to Poseidon for a favorable sign. 
The god of the sea sent a beautiful snow white bull for King Minos to sacrifice in Poseidon's honor. But when Minos decided to keep the bull alive and sacrifice a substitute, Poseidon in rage made Pasiphae fall in love with the bull as a punishment. The queen then ordered the craftsman Daedalus to fashion a hollow wooden cow so that she could mate with the bull. Pasiphae thus gave birth to a monstrous child, half man, half bull, known as the Minotaur. Minos was famed in Greek myth as a benevolent ruler and a legendary lawgiver of the Cretan constitution, which supposedly would later inspire the Spartan constitution. Even the most important ancient Greek historian Thucydides, the author of the Peloponnesian War, considered King Minos a historic, historical ruler and credited him as the first builder of a fleet. As founder of Crete's naval supremacy in the Med Eastern Mediterranean, Minos was also praised for suppressing piracy in the Aegean. After his death, Minos was even appointed as judge of the shades in the underworld, together with his brothers or half-brothers, Ayakos and Radamanthos. As Pasiphae nursed her monstrous child, the Minotaur grew ferocious and fed on humans. Following advice from the Oracle of Delphi, Minos instructed Daedalus to design a building to hold the Minotaur. Daedalus thus constructed a giant maze near the palace of Knossos as a prisoner for the monster. This maze with its perplexing winding corridors, of course, is the famous labyrinth. Daedalus, who is also already mentioned by Homer, was in other words, a skillful craftsman, an architect and an inventor and the father of Icarus. Now that he knew the truth of, queen, of the queen's unnatural child and the secret of the labyrinth, and especially he knew how the Minotaur could possibly escape, King Minos imprisoned Daedalus and his son Icarus in the labyrinth as well. Daedalus and Icarus thus devised a means of escape. They fashioned large wings from feathers fastened in wax. And as they flew away, Icarus, of course, did not heed his father's warning and came too close to the sun. The wax of his wings thus melted. Icarus fell into the sea and drowned. Daedalus, for his part, though heartbroken, managed to escape to Sicily. I'm showing you, by the way, this vessel. Sorry, uh, Victoria. I am, uh, 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 yeah, thank you. Going back, uh, I'm showing you this vessel from the Metropolitan Museum uh, in New York, which uh, is named after this face, uh, the Icarus face or the Icarus painter face, uh, but it's not entirely sure if what you're seeing here is actually Icarus. Um, because um, there are so few images from antiquity uh, that I could use, I had to resort to uh, this particular one. Um, but if we move on, uh, Victoria, to the next uh, image, um, we can return to Minos at Knossos. The narrative continues that Prince Androgeus uh, had won the Panathenaic Games. These are uh, games almost like the Olympic Games, but then held in Athens. And um, now that this prince from Knossos had uh, won his victory, the Athenians were jealous. They sent him to fight the bull of Marathon, and there he was killed. To avenge his son's death, King Minos now demanded that Athens bear him tribute of seven boys and seven girls every nine years, who would then be sent into the labyrinth to feed the Minotaur. When the tributes were about to be sent for the third time, Prince Theseus, the son of King Aegeus of Athens, volunteered to join the exhibition and to slay the monster. When Theseus arrived in Crete, Princess Ariadne, the daughter of Minos and Pasiphae, fell passionately in love with the Athenian prince. 
She gave him a ball of yarn so he could find his way out of the maze and he promised to take her back with him to Athens. Incidentally, in Mycenaean linear B texts found in Knossos, a lady of the labyrinth is mentioned. And of course, here we really want to read this as referring to Ariadne, but could it really be? Again, we have no clear answer. Um, moving to this splendid scene of a Calpis Hydria in the TMA collection, you see Theseus in the act of killing the Minotaur with a sword that he had somehow been able to hide and carry with him into the labyrinth. Notice that on this vase he has a little cloak still wrapped around his shoulders. The scene is flanked by two women who are likely to be Ariadne and her mother Pasiphae, although according to the story they never entered the maze. Also notice that the maze is set in some kind of natural environment with trees in the background. Theseus thus saved the Athenian boys and girls, left Crete with Ariadne. He had promised his father that he would raise white sails on his ship if he had been successful. But he had forgotten to replace the black sails, and so his father believed that his son had died, and King Aegeus threw himself into the sea in despair. The, Ase the Aegean Sea thus bore the king's name ever since. The king's suicide also secured the throne for Theseus, who would become a founding hero to the Athenians, much like Heracles in Sparta and elsewhere. In the wake of this narrative, while stopping over at the island of Naxos, the goddess Athena had urged Theseus to abandon Ariadne. The reason for that, uh, uh, all stories uh, diverge. But in his distress, it was that he neglected to change the sails before returning to Athens. So at least there is an explanation. The Cretan princess had betrayed her father and her country had eloped with the Athenian prince and now woke up to find herself alone and forsaken on the shores of Naxos. But Dionysus, the god of wine and merriment, found her. They fell in love, married, and lived happily ever after. Dionysus would even immortalize Ariadne by placing her wedding wreath among the stars, a constellation that is still known today as Corona, Borealis, no pun intended, by the way. On this lovely Calyx crater, also from the TMA collection, uh, this is a mixing vessel, we see Ariadne and Dionysus stumbling half drunk. Dionysus is fully nude, save for the drapery over his shoulders, and Ariadne uh, wears an overgarment, but her upper body and legs are bared as well. Notice also that her skin is rendered white. She holds a hand drum in her hand. Dionysus carries his pine cone tip staff, and to the side, uh, the viewer's left, stands a fully nude satyr with a beard holding a basket with cakes or other festive fruits. And to further emphasize the festive mood of revel associated with Dionysus, the other side of this vessel depicts a maenad that is a female follower of Dionysus and another satyr. Um, any questions among the audience, Brittany? Are we good? I think we're good. All right. So then I can move to the particulars of my proposal. And what I envision is a major international exhibition about Bronze Age Knossos and the Minoan civilization. Uh, objects from Mycenaean and classical Greece could also serve to elaborate the historical, cultural, and mythological connections with Crete. The exhibition will offer the visitors of the Tampa Museum of Art and its partner venues the opportunity to admire the beautiful masterpieces of Minoan culture which have never been outside of Greece and thus learn more about this mysterious civilization which still has not revealed some of its significant secrets. Who were the people that inhabited Minoan Crete? What language did they speak? 
and what were their relations with later Greek civilizations? What do the depictions of men leaping over bulls and women clutching snakes or blue monkeys engaged in various activities actually mean? Beyond admiring the serene beauty of the frescoes, the exhibition visitors may further contemplate thoughts about the interconnections of the Eastern Mediterranean during the Bronze Age, the continuation and transformation of Minoan culture by the Mycenaean civilization, ethnic and cultural identity, ideals of male and female beauty, and views on religion and spirituality. The enduring classical myths about Minos and Pasiphae, Daedalus and Icarus, not to mention the labyrinth of Knossos, Theseus and the Minotaur, uh, Dionysus and Ariadne, not only reflect the dim recollection of this Bronze Age civilization and its appropriation centuries later by the Greeks, their enduring fame in modern times demonstrate their timeless appeal. For the population of the Tampa Bay area, the maritime connections may be a further element of recognition. While traveling exhibitions of major Bronze Age sites such as Troy and Mycenae have attracted and delighted international museum visitors, to the best of my knowledge, no such exhibition of Minoan Knossos has been attempted ever before. Tampa's link with its sister city Heraklion may provide the convincing argument for hosting this exhibition at the Tampa Museum of Arts, as well as in other partner venues. It goes without saying that this proposal cannot rely on the TMA's antiquities collection. Uh, this is one of the very few objects that you see here in the TMA collection that is from the Minoan period. The museum therefore cannot contribute much in terms of collection to the exhibition. An international touring exhibition on this topic will, however, doubtless elevate the profile of the TMA among the national and international public. Moreover, it will not be difficult to find prestigious venues who would be eager to co-host the exhibition and thus share the financing of the project. The single most important collection of Minoan antiquities is held by the Heraklion Archaeological Museum in Crete. They will, however, be loath to offer their masterpieces for a touring exhibition. This major hurdle can first of all be alleviated because the museum either has duplicates of some of their most significant objects or will have very feasible alternatives in their collection. Moreover, the diplomatic ties between Heraklion and Tampa may well prove decisive in the realization of this exhibition concept. Um, and for some of you who have attended the first lecture, the connection with Nikos Stratakis might be instrumental here as well. The situation may be further remedied by the prominence of the participating venues. The exhibition is further likely to increase tourism even more uh, in Crete. So for sharing the financial burden, which is so important in these difficult times with other national and international venues, to ensure the development of equitable exhibition partnerships, I would suggest collaborating with various organizations and institutions. First and foremost, the pro project will be impossible without the collaboration and partnership of the Heraklion Archaeological Museum as a lender. So please allow me to reiterate that the TMA has not been in contact about this project with them or with any other uh, uh, venues or institutions. This is the first time anyone has ever heard about it. I have little doubt that we will be able to persuade one or two other venues to join in the project and turn it into an international touring exhibition. In the Netherlands, where I live currently, I would first of all think of the Drents Museum in the town of Assen. They have featured exhibitions ranging from the Dead Sea Scrolls to the Chinese terracotta warriors, mummies, uh, as well as exhibitions about Nubia, Persia, the Vikings and the Mayas. 
Um, but another idea could be the Dutch National Museum of Antiquities in Leiden, uh, who might also be considered uh, for the exhibition or at least as lender because they do have some Minoan antiquities in their collection. But we should not forget, of course, the community in the Tampa Bay area. The exhibition will, I believe, offer scores of opportunities for outreach programs and collaborative events. I am thinking of connections between Cretan piracy and the Casparilla Pirate Festival, as well as the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Um, I'm thinking about the connections between the maritime power of Minoan Knossos and the Florida Aquarium in Tampa. Additionally, I would very much like to reach out to the Greek community in the region, not in the least at Tarpon Springs. So in sum, the purpose of today's Antiquities Circle Lecture was to pitch a proposal to you for an ambitious, I have to say, international touring exhibition on Minoan Knossos and the Labyrinth of the Minotaur. We have seen some of the splendor of the wonderful works of art from Bronze Age Crete and its sphere of influence. I have also discussed how the classical reception of the Minoan civilization, uh, uh, illustrating that myths and legends about Minos and Pasiphae, Daedalus and Icarus, Theseus and the Minotaur, Dionysus and Ariadne, reflect some kind of dim awareness of the power and wealth of Knossos. These stories remain popular today in movies, action figures, computer games, not to mention the Percy Jackson series. The archeological ruins of Knossos remain a tourist attraction second in Greece only to the Acropolis of Athens. I would like to close by reiterating something that I have said in my previous lectures, uh, and that is that the ancient world in general continues to inspire and educate us about art and religion, cultural exchange and ethnic diversity, uh, and so many other subjects. The beautiful artifacts on display in the TMA uh, can teach us lessons that remain profoundly relevant today. Please continue to patronage the TMA, to wander around the museum and to wonder about the ancient, modern and contemporary art on display. But do mind social distancing for the time being. Feel free to connect in your own personal, in your own personal way with, uh, with the object. So thank you for your attention. Uh, pardon me for stuttering here and there. Uh, it has been a great pleasure to propose this exhibition concept to you. Uh, and of course, I do hope that we may soon meet each other in person. So that is it. If you have any questions, uh, there should, I think, be about 10 minutes left for that. Uh, I certainly would be very interested in your thoughts about the feasibility of the proposal. If you'd be interested in visiting the exhibition and whether you have any suggestions for improvement. We do have a raised hand. So Judith, I'm going to allow you to talk. Hello, Judith. Hello, Branko. I'm so zooming glad you are here, here, Judith. Thank you for joining us. What well, can thank I you do? For a very interesting lecture. Um, I, I'm afraid I don't have much to say about the final part, which sounds like a, what will be a great exhibition. But going back towards the beginning, uh, when you were discussing uh, Minoan Crete as the first European civilization, I think that's an idea that most of us Minoan archaeologists would push back against nowadays, although it certainly was Arthur Evans' idea and so forth. But at the time of the civilization's height, it really was looking far more and was more part of uh, Near Eastern, Syrian, Lebanese, uh, and even Egyptian world than it was having anything to do with what we call the Europe. So there might be a lot more nuance there describing the ambiguity that uh, archeologists have discovered over the last couple of years. If I may make one other comment, which might be useful, and that is the Minotaur 
does appear actually on Minoan Crete. It's not uh, just a legend in that sense. And it appears rather late uh, in the Mycenaean period. That is the period when the Minoans had already been co conquered by the Greeks from the mainland. Mm -hmm. But there you get images on seals uh, of the first Minotaur. And it's very clearly a hybrid human bull. So you've got more material there than you realize, I think, that you can use for this exhibition. And I uh, very much look forward to it, Ronco. Uh, thank you again, Judith. Uh, for those of you uh, who do not know uh, who was speaking, that is Judith Weingarten, an expert in uh, Bronze Age Near Eastern civilizations. Uh, and the point that she was making is, of course, correct when I said that uh, Knossos or uh, the Bronze Age Crete was Europe's first civilization. I meant that geographically uh, and not culturally. Uh, I think that uh, Crete belongs more to the Near East in this uh, uh, point, and this is also why I was trying to um, argue that we cannot see the ethnicity of the people in Crete, so we do not know if they were ethnically related in any way uh, to the Greek world on the mainland, but certainly uh, the influence was quite direct. Um, what I did not know, uh, Judith, is the image of the Minotaur uh, from the Bronze Age. So if you can help me with that reference later, I would love to hear about it. I'd be it. delighted. I'll send, you some, I'll send you some images. Terrific. And thanks again for joining, uh, Judith. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Any other questions, Brittany? Um, I am not seeing any other at the moment. Mm -hmm. Joanna, maybe you and I can wrap this up. Maybe you have some comments to add. Hi, Franca. Thank you. That was fantastic. I actually. You know, I don't know very much about your area, but I, I really love the Minoan. I really love these works. I think this is my favorite so far. <laughs> that is that is lovely to hear. Um, of course, I squeezed in uh, the classical reception because I think <clears throat> that it's about the labyrinth and the Minotaur, uh, Theseus, Ariadne, and so on um, are so much part of how we can relate back to that world um, that uh, it, it would be a pity not to include it um, uh, and it would help uh, draw in more people. Um, but uh, I think that that is also where the enthusiasm comes from. Uh, maybe not for you, but for, for many people that, that helps um, bring that world to life. Uh, even though much of it remains a mystery uh, that might actually uh, help. Um, but glad to hear that you, uh, that you enjoyed this proposal. I do very much so. Um, based on your survey of the um, antiquities collection, is, do you know how many objects we have from the Minoan from this time period? Uh, vessel that I showed you and there is also a loan object uh, that is a, a pouring vessel also a reton in the shape of a, a ram or a sheep's head. Uh, um, we couldn't get a clear image of that so uh, and it's also a loan object. In the permanent collection I think that uh, that vessel that stone vessel that I showed you is the only one. It's very beautiful though but um, it's certainly something to, to consider for the museum uh, if the scope of the collection could be broadened to include the Bronze Age, uh, because it's so fascinating. Um, but we are, of course, already very happy that you have the, the Theseus and the Minotaur from the Noble Collection. Excellent. Well, I think we're getting a few more comments coming through, Bronco. Yeah, I saw it in the corner of my eye, uh, and I think Brittany has shared links to the previous uh, lectures as well, which are available on Facebook. Yes. And just um, 
there she goes. She has sent the links. Um, I guess one last um, bit of Tampa Museum of Art information is to just remind everyone that we will have a um, um, virtual opening um, this week for our newest exhibition, Living Color, The Art of the Highwaymen. So if you are a member, you are welcome to join us for the virtual hour from 5.30 to 6.30. And then we will also have um, an on-site portion if you are a patron, patron where we are following um, Tampa General Hospital and CDC guidelines in regards to masks and um, social distancing. So more information about both of those events can be um, found on our website. Um, but in general, we um, once Living Color opens, we will have a full house of exhibitions again. And of course you can um, check out our antiquities galleries, which currently features um, the really wonderful exhibition that Brittany Bevel and Cassandra Abel co-curated, Her Story. Um, Brittany, you'll have to help me out with the full title again. Her Story, Ancient Heroines and Everyday Women in Antiquity. That's yes. Cool. Excellent. And um, Bronco, if there isn't anything else, I think that we will sign off and we'll look forward to seeing you on Sunday, December 6th at 1 p.m. That sounds terrific. If you could give me a minute so I can read over the uh, the comments before you and I sign off, that would be terrific. Yes, absolutely. Uh, if there are no further questions, then I thank you all again for attending this lecture and I hope you uh, take advantage of filling in the survey that uh, uh, you'll get a link to uh, later on. Great. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Have a great day.